of soul. This is Bass Talk Live. Your host, Mark Jeffries and Matt Pangrak. BTL is brought to you by Lawrence. Lose. Strike King Lures. Bass Cat Boats. Ducket Fishing. Spro. AFCO. Big Buy Baits. Sunline. And TH Marine. BTL coming at you. Good Friday, everybody. Welcome once again to BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Yes, a special in-studio guest, longtime friend, Mr. Gene Gillen. Gene, thanks for sitting in for Matt. I'm glad to be here. I'm uh, not going to replace Matt, but we'll see if we can't uh, be entertaining today. All right, we'll try. Now, folks, I want to let you know, uh, Matt was supposed to be on this morning live via Skype from his Tulsa location, but I got a text, Gene. I don't know, 5.30, 6 in the morning, something like that, fairly early. And I guess his girlfriend's horse had some kind of issue, and they had to do some kind of emergency surgery on the horse. So he is with his girlfriend and the horse this morning, so hopefully that works out okay. And these are like high-dollar quarter horses. I think that's what they are. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're rodeo horses, yeah, so I yeah. think barrel racing horses yeah. are quarter horses. Yeah, I think so, but I I don't know for sure. But but I know they're worth a lot of money. They're so worth a lot of money, right, and right. vet bills are not cheap. Right. So uh, best of luck with that one. Hopefully everything will work out on that. So I thought it'd be a great idea. We we're planning on doing as many shows as we can to try and get through uh, these very, very challenging times. And Gene lives right here in Norman, Oklahoma. So I thought, hey, what a great way. If anybody out there has any questions from a fish management standpoint, from uh, a, a fisheries biolog- biologist standpoint, a biology, co- whatever, you're going to take questions about anything, right, Gene? I'm, I'm up for all of it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Couple of, couple of things I want to let everybody know. Uh, I, I have been working feverishly to try and line up guests over the next couple of weeks. And I'm kind of in a holding pattern because I am still waiting to see what the decision is, is going to be with Major League Fishing. Uh, right now, everything is a go uh, on the event that they have scheduled at Lake Jordan in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, but... There, there is, I, I, I would say that there is a very uh, decent possibility that that event might possibly be canceled, especially now with the situation that developed out in California where they've basically shut down the state of California. They want everybody. The governor came out and said, hey, do not go outside unless it is either this, this, or this. And there's a list of things that you can leave your house for. So uh, I, I just, I don't know. I know some of the anglers from California actually went home, Gene, uh, during the break. So we're going to wait and see. And, and, and if, if that event is postponed, the next event is supposed to be right here in Oklahoma at Grand Lake. Uh, I guess we will wait and see what the situation would be on that. But as of right now, from an MLS standpoint, everything is on schedule and they are moving forward with that event. If that event does get postponed and rescheduled, then I will be doing everything I can to get as many people right here in studio to where you, the fans, can interact with these guys uh, here in the studio, of which we are coronavirus free. And I made sure, Gene, before you came in, (laughs) I've got the uh, disinfectant Lysol wipes over there. I wiped everything down. I do it on a daily basis. I'm taking every precautionary measure to make sure that the BTL studio remains virus free. That's that's always comforting to know. And and, and we are social distancing here. Yes, we're, we are. We, you we're, know we're, that, we're, uh, somebody I, I saw somewhere that from a fish in the fishing world that's that's basically a rod length apart. So if you're two guys in a boat and as long as you're not hitting each other with your rods, you're 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 fine. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, I know I've received some emails from people. Uh, there was some information on the instant feedback yesterday, Gene. Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about it before the show. There are areas across the country that the, the cities or the states are starting to shut down ramps right. and, and not allow people to go out and fish. Uh, what can you add on that? Do you have any information on that? Have you talked to some of your colleagues maybe across the uh, across the nation on the status of the ramps and stuff? You know, we, I, I sent out a, an email to all of our Bass Nation conservation directors a few days ago and, and just to kind of get a feel for what they're seeing in their states. And, and it varies across the country as far as who's who's shut down and who's open. Um, the, the, a lot of the municipalities are following their state or their governor's orders and basically closing things. Uh, sometimes it's just the visitor centers and the, the, the public access areas like boat ramps are still staying open. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, is kind of leaving it up to each of the individual districts. For example, our, our region, the region headquarters for our area is actually in Dallas, but that includes the Tulsa District, the Fort Worth District, Galveston, uh, most of Texas, Oklahoma. And, and they're leaving it up to the local office, uh, in this case, our Tulsa district here in Oklahoma. And, and so they're, like most core districts, they're closing their public offices and places where the public could come and interact with staff. But they're leaving the boat ramps uh, open. Now, some places they're closing bathrooms. Uh, so it, it's, uh, you know, you, got, you maybe have, have access to the lake, but the other facilities and the other amenities that are there might be closed. So it's just kind of a case-by-case case basis. And I, I think as, as this thing progresses, I've got a feeling we will probably see more restrictions and more closures. Uh, but it's going to be a case by case basis, and I think anybody that decides, well, I'm going to I'm going to practice my social distancing and my my self quarantine, and I'm going to do it in my boat, probably need to check ahead before they make a any kind of a distance drive to somewhere to to try to put a boat in the water, just to make sure that those facilities are still open. All right. I know here in Oklahoma, I made some phone calls yesterday to see uh, what was open. I talked to Ed Barton. Uh, over on the eastern side of the state. Everything is open there. The, one of the issues that we're dealing with here in Oklahoma is the amount of rain that we had over the last probably five, six days. Uh, a lot of the lakes are up, and uh, for the most part, everything is still open here in Oklahoma, Gene. Right, and, and that, I'm seeing that in, like I say, in the, the majority of the places. There are just certain states, uh, I believe Illinois, uh, basically the governor said close it all. Uh, you know, but right next door in Indiana or in Michigan, uh, the the state offices are closed, but the boat ramps are, are still open, at least for now. Um, the one thing that, that concerns me a little bit is when the government has said, you know, they don't want people getting together in groups of more than, at first it was 500, then it went to 100, then it went to 50, and now they're saying 10 people at a time. And, and you look at some pictures on on social media of, of a boat ramp at Gunnersville yesterday, and there's a hundred boats there. Oh, wow. Um, you know, people are going fishing, and uh, the weather's good. It's that time of year. The, the, the bass are biting. Um, it, it's not an organized group. You know, a lot of most tournament organizations have shut down their tournaments for now. But it's just, it's still a pretty large gathering of a lot of people. And I'm a little concerned that at some point, the the authorities might look at that and say, "Whoa, this this is too many people at one place at one time, and we're going to have to do something about it." I don't know that that's going to happen, but that kind of in the back of my mind, that's one of the things I thought about. All right, well, uh, you know, sometimes in this situation, this challenging situation they were in, uh, you know, a few hours on the water, two three hours, go out, try and catch some fish, might be just. You know the thing that people need to to relax and 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 not think about everything that that everybody is dealing with right now. So, uh, you know, I spoke to a gentleman with a tackle manufacturer yesterday, and I said I just flat out asked him. I go, "What's the impact right now?" And he goes, "Quite honestly, from an online standpoint, he goes, things are okay." 
uh, people are still buying things online. But at the same time, Gene, this is the time of the year that people do what? It's probably one of the highest purchasing times right. that this industry has You know, in March and April. So uh, I, I just, uh, it, it could be a little bit skewed, ob- obviously, but uh, maybe if people can get out there and, and do a little fishing and, and try and relax a little bit, that maybe that's the right thing to do. Well, you know, the all, all the medical folks say that if you are less stressed, you are less susceptible to disease. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can't think of very many other ways that are any better than getting out on the water and going fishing to to calm down and, and de-stress. Um, yeah. You know, when we got back from the Classic... Uh, when's that been a week and a half ago now a um, couple of days at home I, I was ready to go fishing and I, I took advantage of a, one of these pretty spring days that we had and and got out on the water and and just by myself got in my little mini boat went down to my little lake in southern Oklahoma and caught the fool out of them really and and uh, you know but it was it was one of those kind of days that uh, that really helped me kind of settle down from the whole craziness of the Bassmaster Classic week and kind of put into perspective what's ahead of us. All right, I, let's talk a little bit about the Classic because I think that's uh, uh, it, it is a, a very uh, demanding job for, for you and your staff when you have that many miles that you're traveling back and forth to the lake. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of tell us a little bit about how the Classic went for you guys from a, a fish care standpoint, from a, a, a catch and release standpoint, mm-hmm. and uh, was this, did everything pretty much go as planned? It did. Um, you know, the for uh, many, many years, I can't think back how far, any time that we have a, a Bassmaster Classic weigh-in that is many miles away from where the fish are being caught, we have to transport those fish to and from the lake. And the number one question we get absolutely far and away is, are the fish going home? And the the local anglers want to know, are their fish coming back to their lake? And and we always tell them, yes, that's, you know, we're just borrowing them for the day. (laughs) And uh, in this case, uh, we we partnered with the Alabama Freshwater Fisheries Division. Uh, They provided fish hauling trucks. You know, the anglers brought the fish from Gunnersville to Birmingham in their live wells. It's about a 90-mile drive. Once we got to to the arena and the fish got weighed, they were put in the fish hauling trucks that the Alabama DNR provided. They then took those fish overnight and took them to one of their fish hatcheries where they could observe them and make sure they were healthy. And then after they collected all the fish from all three days' worth of weigh-ins, they took them back to Gunnersville. Huh. Of the 520 fish that were weighed in uh, at the tournament, 515 went home. Wow. So we only lost five fish out of over 500. So it's less than 1% of the fish that, that died that didn't go back to the lake. And by them holding those fish for a few days, they were able to observe those. And, and they culled out a couple of fish that they thought, well, these might not make it. So they they were very cautious about uh, not releasing anything that they didn't think was going to survive. So we feel pretty good about those numbers. And And to be honest, that's kind of been the trend with most of the classics we've had in the past, that we've had 95 to 100 percent. Uh, release rates and uh, you know a lot of that a is because the anglers are fishing for a lot of money they don't want dead fish so they take care of their fish two in this time of year the water's still cold the water was 52 degrees and that makes a huge difference on the the amount of stress on those fish and the fact that they can survive coming in being weighed and then taken back to the lake so all in all, it, it worked out very well, and uh, we were pretty pleased with the results. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, were you surprised, one of the things that Matt and I talked about, that uh, obviously Gunnersville being Gunnersville, but there was only one angler, Hank Cherry, the guy that won it, 
that averaged 20 pounds a day? Was it just a matter of all the, the, the water levels and, and the weather? Do you think that obviously had yeah. something to do with it? Or do you, do you believe and feel that Gunnersville is still one of the greatest fisheries in the U.S.? No, I do. Gunnersville is, is obviously one of those top producers, has been for years. Uh, the habitat is still good. There's a lot of vegetation. Uh, what what a lot of people unless they've really kind of been paying attention to the situation don't realize is the amount of water that's been going down the tennessee river for months and months and months and that high flow um you know we we wound up having to to cancel one of our tournaments at chickamauga because of flooding which just upstream from gunnersville and and so a lot of that water uh had had muddied things up when you've got that tremendous amount of flow, it changes the behavior of the fish. And I think that's, that's a lot of it. The, the spring weather, you know, you just kind of add all those little pieces together. I don't know that you can point at one thing and say, here's the problem. But when you add them all together, it, it made for maybe a little bit less than ideal conditions, and, and the catch reflected that. But as far as the health of the fishery goes, there's, there's not a problem there. The Gunnersville is still a great lake, and uh, lots of bass, lots of forage. The habitat's looking good. Um, I, I think there's still, still potential there. Uh, let's see here. Matt from Minnesota on the instant feedback uh, has a question. I'm gonna kind of, I don't know, kind of add something to his question here with the lack of activity on the lakes this time of the year is the obvious answer that this is going to be really really good for the spawn because of the shorter period of time that people are actually on the 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 lakes fishing trying to catch spawning fish and everything does it have an impact when you have low numbers and low number of tournaments on the bodies of water biologically it won't have much effect Um, the reason is the the amount of fishing pressure the number of anglers out there, the number of people that are fishing in tournaments or just fun fishing is is not really affecting the production of bass. It may f- affect the behavior of those fish. Obviously, if you've got a tremendous amount of pre- uh, fishing pressure, it, it changes how the fish react and where they set up and uh, how they react to lures. But in terms of them going through their spawning processes and the number of baby bass that are produced... Uh, in the springtime, it's really not going to have that big of an impact in terms of, you know, a lot more bass being produced. It's it's really more that idea of you've got potentially weeks or months where the fish are not being pressured, and and it changes their behavior. And, and I think in some respects they probably become less wary. So when fishing does resume, uh, any kind of numbers of people start going back to the lakes it's not exactly like a new lake situation where the fish are just dumb as rocks <laughs> but but you know I, I think it will probably make make for some good fishing when when fishing does kind of resume because they haven't been pressured and harassed as much during the springtime as they might in a, in a normal year all right i want to pick your brain right now because one of the cool things that you've been able to do over your career is the shock boat and the experience that you've had mm-hmm. you know over the years uh going down the bank and and actually shocking up fish to get uh data on what you shock up what, what's a story that you can tell me and the fans <laughs> about maybe somebody was in front of you or you saw some guy go down a bank he spent an hour going down this bank and then you pull up behind him with the shock boat do you have a story like that oh yeah yeah. i I could i could rattle them off for days um i I used to tell people that when my former life as a fishery biologist one of my greatest joys in life was to be able to follow fishermen down the shoreline with my electrofishing boat to show them what they missed (laughs) um and 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 any number of times on lakes here in oklahoma we were able to do that sort of thing and sometimes the anglers would would see us coming and they just kind of back up off the bank and let let us go by and and so they could just watch and see what we were turning up Uh, other times they get really mad because it's like well we can't believe we missed that many fish that that there were so many there that we didn't catch um 
years ago, and I can't remember what what year this was, there was a young professional angler who uh, Bass sent a photographer, uh, outdoor rider, with him, and the whole idea was for us to do just exactly that. They were going to go fishing, the, the angler, uh, this up-and-coming pro, and, and this outdoor rider, and they would fish, and then we would come in right behind them and electrofish that spot <laughs> and show what was really there. Yeah. And, and over the course of a day, it almost got embarrassing because they would they would go in uh, there'd be a beautiful lay down and they'd go in and just beat the bark off of that tree <laughs> throwing every kind of lure they had at it and maybe catch one fish and we'd pull up and oh, oh there's two three four pounders and, oh look here's a six pounder and um and it, and it just happened over and over during the day and and so you know what it what it reinforced to me was the idea that if and and the, and the places that they picked to fish obviously were good spots so they were using their their fishing intuition and they were they were looking at the the thing just like any fisherman would and said there ought to be bass there (laughs) but they couldn't get them to bite yeah and electricity doesn't know any difference and so when when we pulled in with the electric fishing boat and start turning up all these fish it uh it, it really brought home the idea that they were thinking right and they were picking good spots it's just the fish didn't cooperate that day in terms of trying to bite whatever they were throwing. Yeah. Uh, a number of people on the instant feedback chain, how does that affect the fish once oh. once you guys leave or Ele- whatever? Electrofishing is, is very short term. Um, it, it immobilizes the fish generally just long enough for us to dip them up in a net and put them in the live well. Uh, they come to very, very quickly. It, it doesn't do anything to the fish physically uh, long term. And and once they're released, uh, they they go back to resuming their normal activities very very quickly. Uh, a lot of folks think, oh well, the the state shocked this lake yesterday. I'm not going to find any any bass that are going to want to bite, and that's uh, that's not true. We we see that <clears throat> consistently that it doesn't have any long term effects in terms of the the behavior of those bass. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Matt in Minnesota wants to know, have you ever shocked up what you think might be a lake record or even a world record? Lake, lake records, yes. Uh, state or world records, no. Obviously, world records, yeah. no. But um, we, uh, we came really close to, to shocking up a, a lake record years ago at, at a power plant lake here in Oklahoma. We were collecting fish to take to the the boat and tackle show where they have those great big giant aquariums yeah. that the guy gets up on top and practices showing you how to catch f- fish different kind of lures yeah you know we would provide the fish for those big mobile aquariums and and we uh we rolled one at this lake that at the time would have i'm sure would have been a state record um but the current was fast enough that it it pushed the fish away from the dip net and we oh, never geez. got it in the net <laughs> how big was it at the time it was probably 12 pounds or wow. 13 or something like that and and I'm, I'm pretty sure at the time it would have been the state record but you know every biologist that i know around the country has always heard the stories about how they were at some lake and electrofish some state record yeah. and it's it's like every time that story gets retold the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger all right frank in michigan wants to know what kind of damage gets done to the fish when you bounce it off the carpet you know that's that's a really good question and there's not a lot of good information we know that the slime coat on the fish is is kind of their first line of defense against disease and and bacteria and infections that sort of thing but the amount of uh, slime loss that happens from the fish bouncing off the, the carpet or the deck of the boat is really probably pretty minimal, uh, even compared to when people grasp the fish. Uh, if, if you don't hold it by the lower lip, if you grab it by the body, you're probably taking off just as much slime that way as if you let it touch the carpet on the boat. Um, for the most part, though, if the fish is healthy otherwise, and some of that slime gets wiped off, 
they're going to regenerate that slime. That's their, their coating. That's, that's what they do. And if they're healthy otherwise, any kind of bacteria or infection or whatever that might try to get a hold of them, they're going to fight that off. So I don't think that it's, it's a, a live or die kind of thing. Simply hitting the deck of the, carp, of the boat and the carpet is, is not certainly a death sentence for those fish. Uh, I think that's kind of been blown out of proportion a little bit. We certainly don't like to see that. Uh, where they're bounced around like that um, just from a perception standpoint we don't want people to abuse the fish you know you want to treat fish humanely and and and, and be good to them uh, because if you do if you do one thing right you'll do other things right in terms of keeping those fish healthy yeah but uh, you know there there really hasn't been a lot of detailed study to, to prove that that one way or another is is better now the use of landing nets uh, there have been some studies that have looked at different kinds of landing nets and we know that the rubber nets or the ones that are coated with vinyl are better for the fish than the old uh, the old mono almost looks like knotted monofilament yeah uh, you know those those old kind of nets like that uh, that have that real hard nylon they do tend to remove a lot of slime when that fish is kind of wiggling and flopping around in the net and and those kind of nets we know can be more detrimental than uh, say a rubber or a coated net all right jason wilson wants to know uh because of catch and release do you think that the health of some fisheries suffer because of overpopulation definitely absolutely um and, and my company bass b-a-s-s has has you know kind of started the whole catch and release movement back in the 70s with, with black bass and I, I think it has been oversold in some cases and biologists across the country will agree that there are many instances when harvesting fish is the right thing to do and and what we've always tried to try to promote is the idea of selective harvest there are times when catch and release is very important especially with larger older fish that are more rare but in a lot of cases, if you don't harvest the smaller bass, you wind up with an overpopulation. You wind up with too many mouths to feed and not enough food to go around, and the growth slows way down. And at some point, you wind up with a whole lot of little bass and very few that get bigger because they just can't grow fast enough to get into those larger sizes. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea was slot length limits. Everybody thinks slot length limits are the answer. Oh, put a slot at limit on my lake, and it's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. The problem is, with a slot limit, you've got to harvest those smaller fish under the slot for it to work. And if people don't keep fish in, in any kind of numbers, a slot limit doesn't fix anything. Yeah. All right, Scott from Indy wants to know, cull tax. You know, they made the switch to where it wasn't like the stringer type yep. where you put a hole yep. in the fish's mouth to the clip. Right. But uh, if there's some organizations out there that still allow the, the what, stringer rings rather than the clip rings, mm -hmm. does that really do a whole lot of damage to the fish, and how quickly do they heal from that? The... Uh at our Bass Conservation Summit at the Classic, we actually had a presentation on this. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission was doing a study in, in a hatchery situation where they looked at all of the different kinds of culling clips. And if a penetrating, the, the, the safety pin type clip, if it's applied correctly, the hole that it leaves in the bass's mouth is not very big and heals up rather quickly in a matter of days or weeks the problem becomes when they're not installed correctly and it tears a big gash in the membranes and in, in, in the fish's mouth those big slices and gashes don't heal up as sometimes at all and those fish have they may not die from it but their breathing and their feeding can be affected because a bass to feed effectively, they suck in their food. Well, if there's a hole in their mouth, it, it kind of messes up that vacuum process, yeah. and they can't, they can't feed as effectively, and they also can't breathe as effectively. And so 
generally what we've seen over the years is that fish that have those big gashes in their in their under their gullets and in their throat uh, are thinner they're 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 in poorer condition uh, like I say they they've survived but they're not thriving so that was the whole impetus to try to go to the non penetrating or the clamp on type culling clips there has been a lot of concern with those now though that they're they press too hard they they squeeze too tight on the tissue and that irritates the fish so they're constantly shaking and trying to get rid of them or that it actually can cause like bruising uh and so there's there's a lot of a lot of the different companies that make those kind of culling clips have redesigned them they're they're coming out with different models that that don't that lock on but don't squeeze as hard and so i think it's kind of an evolving process uh the the penetrating style uh bass and and a lot of other tournament groups decided uh, to to not allow those anymore um in favor of the clamp-ons the the clamp-on style i think are still evolving and i think there's probably some room for improvement in all of that to to make sure that that the fish are, are handled correctly the other thing that either way when people yank them out of the live well using the culling clips and put all the weight of that clip of the fish on those clips that's not good on either one of them the whole the whole idea we try to stress is is simply use the culling rope to lead the fish to the surface of the live well and then grasp it by the lower jaw stick your thumb in his mouth and pick him up that way yeah and not just yank a whole bunch of them out of the live well at once uh, by the ropes because that's what causes the tears and the the extra strain on the mouth and the ligaments and joints and all that all right good stuff all right we're gonna take a break come back and uh we're gonna we're gonna pick gene's brain from gene being the fan instead of the fisheries biologist all right coming back at you everybody stay tuned we'll be right back the ultimate fishing system starts with lorenz hds live Upgrade to HDS Live with a ghost trolling motor, live sight transducer, or structure scan 3D and get up to $500 cash back. Yeah, you care about gear ratios, inches per turn, and ball bearings, but most importantly, you want reliability and dependability in the equipment you use. Lose doesn't cut corners when it comes to the gear they build. The new Speed Spool LFS is the best $99 reel in the market. Go see for yourself. We've paired one of the most iconic hulls in the history of bass boats with a proven lineup of trusted accessories. We're bringing you best-in-class value and performance, leaving others in your wake. Turnkey value, turnkey performance. The Pantera 2 is an overachiever in the 19-foot category. Once you hit the throttle, you'll feel the rush, and there's no looking back. Kevin, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just filling in for Billy. I need a 660 Shad crankbaits in uh, the Series 5 model. We're out. You're not out. You got all kinds of them right there. We're out. Kevin, I need six. Have a lollipop. I do not want a lollipop. Have a lollipop. Do you have it in sexy shad color? At Duck at Fishing, we have assembled the top pros in the country to help us design rods to give you a competitive advantage. Castability, strength, durability, action, sensitivity, weight and balance, and consistency. Combine that with the best warranty in the industry and you have rods that are pro-driven. Duck at Fishing, pro-driven. I want to share to you a new product we got coming out from Sunline. This is the FC leader size spools that we have now. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests for this. A lot of you guys use fluorocarbon for leaders only, myself included. 
And one of the problems you have is when you have a 200 yard spool, that might last you two, three, four years. You might even lose it before you even get done with the spool. So we've gone to a little smaller spool. These are 50 yard spool sizes. You know, that way you're not holding your line on forever. You can keep your line fresh, use it when you can. It stores real easily in the boat. We got all of our popular line sizes that you're used to with our sniper from five to 14 pound. If you guys are looking for a line that you're only tying for a liter, Go check out Sunline FC Leader 100% fluorocarbon and give it a try. All right, we are back with our special guest, Mr. Gene Gilliland. In studio, Matt, he is uh, trying to take care of his horse right now. So hopefully, hopefully, Gene, that's going okay. Uh, a couple more questions on the instant feedback. We'll get to that here in a second. But I want to know, uh, we've known each other for a long time. And uh, in previous shows that you've been on, we've talked about how we've met and everything. But I, what I want to know is when, when you're doing things at the Classic and other tournaments and everything, do you become a fan also? I mean, are you kind of observing and, and watching what's taking place with some of these guys that you've seen over the years? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, I'm certainly a fan of the sport. Um, I, I don't get to, to be as active a fan because I'm backstage all the time. Yeah. I don't get to see what goes on up front on the front of the stage where they're the way in the fish and and showing them off and that kind of stuff but but i have become friends with a lot of the guys over the years and and certainly uh their their families you know the people that come the the fans that of their own that come to support those guys uh but yeah i i uh i i don't follow the statistics i don't keep track of you know exactly who caught what and how many pounds they had yesterday or the day before the week before that kind of stuff you know like a lot of people do with with sports statistics yeah um but I, but i i do you know treat keep track of uh you know how, how they're doing and how their season's going um uh you know it's uh when when you get backstage a lot of times the guys they're they're just people you know they're a lot of times even some of the superstars in this sport folks kind of put them on a pedestal but you get them backstage where they're just hanging out they're yeah. just people and and you can talk to them and you can you can talk about other stuff besides fishing you know how's the family doing have you been hunting lately have, you know how are things going in your state um just just conversation about things and uh, certainly that kind of humanizes the whole thing a little bit and that's that's one of the things i like about the being backstage is a is a, a little different atmosphere than what you see out on camera in the front yeah so who has been the coolest person that you've been with the funnest time over the years uh what was a memorable trip that you spent with somebody gosh i don't know um i from a i don't know if i could put a person on it but the uh the bracket tournaments that we did for a couple of three years when we had we called it the classic bracket yeah where at the at the end of the regular season they picked out eight guys that they put into this bracket format where you do the catch weigh and release thing uh, and and it narrows down to one person, and that person got back into the classic format. You know, it was kind of a second chance tournament. Yeah. And and I got to be in the boat with with uh, a lot of guys over the two or three years we did that. And and that was a tremendous amount of fun. I really enjoyed uh, just talking to them, just uh, kind of picking their brains and and you know listening to how they they approached uh, these situations uh and and it was a kind of a low pressure format and and that really kind of put a lot of the guys at ease and uh but that that was i really enjoyed that that format and the the, the opportunity to do that and then we've also we still do that with the college anglers the, yeah 
the kids that uh, that win at the college national championship, we put some of them into this bracket format, and and you get to spend the day in the boat with some of these college anglers. And I've gotten to know a couple of those kids, uh, Nolan Miner from West Virginia and Cody Huff, the the, the one that's, yeah. that's uh, you know was in the classic this year uh, from Bethel. Uh, really, really good kids, and I, I, I've really enjoyed working with some of those college kids too. Because it's, you know, yeah, they're the, they're kind of the future of the sport of professional fishing. Yeah. Um, but just to see the enthusiasm and and the drive that they have to to make it in the sport, it's it's pretty neat. Have you fished in Mexico at El Salto? I have not been to El Salto. I've been to a couple of the other Mexican lakes way back years ago when when they were the hot ones to go to i went yeah. to guerrero once and went to Backrack once but uh i haven't been to el salto i'm i'm waiting on that that invite <laughs> well you know who can make that happen i, I right? do i do i do and yeah, we're it, talking about mr judicy the the scheduling um it seems like every time we get ready to go uh there's there's been some conflict of some sort uh, yeah. kind of like going to the amazon i was supposed to go to the amazon on a on a uh, peacock bass trick back in january of this year of this year wow and the rainy season came early and and basically flooded things out and so we had to cancel that trip and now it's been nothing but rain it's in it's the rainforest yeah. you know it's just gonna yeah. rain yeah what about canada uh have not been to canada and and haven't had as much desire really i mean i think a really cool thing maybe to be go up and chase giant northern pike or something like that but a lot of my uh i I get real close when i go to uh minnesota and michigan smallmouth fishing that's if i had to pick one thing to do i'd chase smallmouth bass the rest of my life um i i just absolutely have fallen in love with brown bass and uh have have basically traveled all over the country doing that and and that's that's probably my my strongest passion all right very cool jd in illinois back to the instant feedback he wants to know the whole air bladder fizzing a fish and all that there's plenty of videos and stuff out there Mm -hmm. is there anything that you would recommend as far as people watching and learning really how to do that yep there's two videos on bassmaster.com if you'll go to the conservation news section and then scroll down to where it says videos when you get into the conservation videos there are two videos barb elliott our conservation director in new york goes through the whole process of fizzing smallmouth bass and largemouth bass and and those are to me the the most instructional videos out there they not only tell you how to do it but why and Mm. that's a bit and what to look for so that um, you, you know why you're doing what you're doing and uh, the technique and everything is is very well explained on those videos on bassmaster.com all right frank in michigan wants to know what about the lakes that get sprayed for vegetation to kill the vegetation what effect does that have on the fish it it has very little direct effect on the fish uh the the herbicides and stuff that are used um, basically target the aquatic plants and then they disintegrate or they go away they degrade very quickly uh, in the short term if there's large amounts of vegetation that are sprayed and it starts to die and decompose that can change the oxygen levels and fish will leave those areas and so it can change the the location or the behavior of those fish uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't interact directly with the fish themselves but the whole issue of aquatic plant management is a is a very touchy subject across the country there's a lot of controversy right now in florida but it's an issue in california and michigan and tennessee river kentucky tennessee river and there's a lot of misconceptions about what's going on in fact in the tennessee river the weekend before the classic tva took me and two of our elite pros uh west logan and uh um brain did yeah that guy that guy (laughs) took us took us out um and and showed us where they were not spraying yeah because there's this conception this misconception among a lot of anglers that they're out there just broadcasting and killing all the weeds and what they showed us on gunnersville lake is that they they spray around boat ramps and beaches and public access areas 
that amounts to less than 5% of the total area of that lake. But but the the public and especially social media, there's so much misinformation out there about the evils of weed control. Helicopters in the night. Black helicopters. <laughs> um, and, yeah. and the other thing that people have got to understand, too, is that most of these lakes weren't built for fishing. They were built for something else um, in terms of reservoirs. And natural lakes, you know, it, there's a lot of other people that use those bodies of water. Yeah. You know, it's for water supply. It may be for drinking water. It may be for flood control, other types of recreation that go on. And so what we've always tried to advocate is if there's an issue with aquatic plant management, fishermen need to be part of the decision-making process. They need a seat at the table when the decisions are made on how we're going to manage those weeds so that we don't want to eradicate, we want to manage yeah. and, and make sure that there's a balance there. And that's, that's the biggest key is, you know, if, if people have got concerns about how their lake or their reservoir is being managed in terms of aquatic plants, they need to be part of the process, make sure that the angler's voices are heard in that, those, those decisions. All right. Another Matt uh, on the Instant Feedback wants to know, have you talked or can you talk a little bit about delayed tournament mortality from obviously <clears throat> post tournaments a yep. day later, two days later? Sure. Uh, what, what can you say about that? It's not a problem. And <laughs> delayed mortality is certainly there. We know that if you look at all bass tournaments across all seasons in all kind of conditions, yes, bass are going to die because of bass tournaments. Um, in some cases, it might be delayed mortality might be 20 percent, 25 percent of the fish that are weighed in may die within a week. But nobody anywhere in the country has ever shown that that affects the entire bass population. Yes, fish from that tournament die and the next tournament and the next tournament. But in the grand scheme of things, that bass population in that lake is none the worse for wear. And that's, that's one of the messages that we've been trying to convey to people is that we want to do the best we can about keeping our fish healthy and getting them back into the lake because yeah. we know you can recycle them. Yeah. Bass can be caught again. We know that. But the amount of mortality that's related to bass tournaments uh, is not hurting bass populations. You look at lakes like Sam Rayburn, a 50-pound bag down there just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Sam Rayburn has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tournaments a year and has for 30 years. Yeah. Table Rock, you, you name it, uh, places that get a tremendous amount of fishing pressure. The bass populations are still strong. Yeah. And, and the tournaments, you know, back to that question earlier about, well, it, maybe do we need to harvest a few more fish? Yeah. There's probably places where the fish that die because of tournaments is actually a good thing because it's helping to balance things out a little bit uh we certainly don't want to encourage people to kill fish unnecessarily right um but but to blame bass tournaments for for declines in fishing is just a scapegoat there's something else going on it's not the tournaments that are causing the problems uh chris wants to know nets or no nets what's really better for the fish as i said earlier the if you're going to use a net um, nets are good, uh, but they need to be the right kind of net. The rubber or, or the vinyl coated ones uh, are, are the ones that don't scrape off all the slime. Uh, they do tend to, um, you know, the fish settle down and you can get a hold of them and it's easier to hang on to them. You know, obviously, if you can get the fish in the boat without it bouncing off the carpet and off the deck and that sort of thing, um, th that's good. Uh, but in terms of net versus no net, uh, I think it's kind of a toss-up. Uh, certainly, it, in terms of landing fish, uh, especially if you've got a jerk bait and he's got three sets of treble hooks in his <laughs> mouth, uh, and you're trying to figure out how to get that fish in the boat without getting the hook in you, yeah. then 
nets are a really good thing to have handy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from that standpoint, that fish is probably going to benefit from it because you're going to get him out of the water, get him unhooked, and potentially release it or whatever you're going to do with it quicker if you've got a net than if you're trying to, to do it by hand. All right. Maynard, a uh, longtime viewer, listener, wants to know, will a hook totally dissolve if left in a bass's mouth? No, they don't. Um, they used to. Back when everybody used gold crappie hooks, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the research on on some of the old carbon steel hooks, th- those hooks rusted away very quickly. But anymore, a lot of especially the hooks that we use, say in, in soft plastic baits for that you're putting in a creature bait or a worm or something, a lot of those hooks are coated to prevent rust, and so they don't just rust away like they used to. 20 30 years ago yeah. and so we have started trying to encourage people to learn how to remove hooks even if they're fairly deep down in the fish or in the gullet uh, and there are some techniques that if there's there's videos and diagrams on the internet that people can look at on on how to basically go in through the gills and turn the hook upside down and then come back through the mouth with your long nose pliers to be able to pull a hook out um, we always tell people, though, that it, anytime that fish is out of the water, it's holding its breath. And so you don't want to take too long to take a hook out. If you've got to perform major surgery yeah. and you're going to have that fish out of the water for two or three minutes, that's probably not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but if you can get it out, you know, in, in the length of time you're hold, that you can hold your breath, then it's probably a good thing to try to get those hooks out. Let me ask you this, and I don't know if people that are watching or listening can picture this, but if you have a fish and he's got it in the gullet, you know, it happens, Carolina rigging a lot, right? But you see, obviously, the the eye part of the hook, and then you can see the barb. It's all the way through. It's stuck in there. Mm-hmm. What I've always been told is take a pair of pliers, cut the hook uh, where, the, where the eye is, mm-hmm. and then just take your needle nose and push it through, and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you think about what bass eat. It they got all kinds of things that have spines and needle. Yeah. You know, the the like the pinchers on a crayfish or the the spines on a bluegill. So they get holes poked in them all the time. Yeah, and that's just part of nature. And those those wounds will heal up. So anything that you can do to to go ahead and get that hook out is better, uh, especially if it's a really big hook. Um, because I, like I said, that since they don't always rust away, those great big hooks can actually kind of clog things up internally yeah. and, and create a blockage that can cause that fish a lot more problems down the road. All right, Jason wants to know what's your favorite lake to fish? Public or private? <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about, have you ever been to Big Dave's Lake? No, okay. but, but I've got one about 35 miles from there that's every bit as good. Okay. All right. Um, I had five fish for 38 pounds there last week. Oh, geez. Uh, I said to throw. We may need to go there, Gene. Yeah, we may need to. <laughs> um, favorite lake. I, you know, over the years, I have, uh, I have gotten to where I really like fishing Lake Eufaula and Lake Texoma. And I'd kind of put them on even par because the variety there's there's so many different kinds of habitat uh and and whether you like to fish wood or weeds or rocks or whatever there's a lot of opportunity there for for either one of those and uh and that's that's one of the things i kind of like about those lakes you know if i had to pick one lake in oklahoma that i probably had more success on than anyway it'd have to be sardis uh i've I've caught more and bigger fish at sardis than just about anywhere in the state and and i I really, really like to fish a swim jig in the water willow. That's, that's cool stuff. And that's that's what you do at Sardis. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, we're going to do this. We're going to take a break. Come back. More instant feedback. And you know what, Gene? We may even take a phone call or two. I need to let everybody know. We will let you know on Monday who are the winners of the prize pack that both Matt and I were giving away from yesterday's Sunline Hotline show. So we'll do that. On Monday, 
Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to Matt, so I don't know who he was going to pick. So <laughs> we'll wait till Monday. All right, short break. Coming back with Gene Gilliland. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back. Let's face it. Fishing electronics are no longer an afterthought. They've become a necessity. And at the Bass Take, our experts match you with the right electronics, provide professional installation, and educate you to help maximize your catching results while providing support along the way. <laughs> because let's be honest, it's about catching, not just fishing. And when you're ready for better results, join the Bass Tank team. Visit us today on Facebook or go to thebasstank.com. Blue Water by TH Marine. Offering LED lighting solutions for your boat, trailer, truck, ATV, and so much more. Engineered and built to be rugged with waterproof and submersible options. Designed for easy installation, Blue Water is available in a variety of colors and styles. All backed by a limited lifetime warranty. Blue Water by TH Marine. The name Spro says it all. Spro stands for Sports Professionals. When you look at the, the pro staff that Spro has brought on board over the past 15 years, it's been pretty incredible. I mean, one got it just then. From the development of the Rock Crawler to the McStick, from the Fat Pop of the Little John series, when you tie a Spro bait on, you know it's been designed by a professional to get the job done. While I travel the country on the Bassmaster Elite Series, I simply can't let the weather be the reason I don't win $100,000. That's why I use AFCO clothing to keep me warm, dry, and protected from whatever Mother Nature wants to throw at me. My season depends on it. My career depends on it. AFCO, any fish, any water. All of us on the Pro Tournament Trail use Gamagatsu hooks. Why? Because they are absolutely the best. It's not about how many bites you get, it's how many you put in the boat. Gamagatsu makes hooks for every fishing style. We didn't come this far to lose fish. Did you? For more information, visit Gamagatsu.com. The Big Bite Baits Kamikaze Swim On is a very unique bait and it's got a full body but with ribs to give it a bigger profile but not more plastic. It's got a jointed tail that gives it a lot of action as well as this up and down crawl type trail with holes and ribs in it so it creates a bubble trail almost. This bait is supposed to be fished upside down or vertical like this on a great for a chatter bait. I prefer it on a swim jig as well. But you can also cut it down and put it on the back of a finesse jig. You know, flip it around for some spotted bass or flipping docks. Anytime you want a small, compact, you know, little trailer for it, this is great for it. So check out the full lineup of swim ons at bigbitebaits.com. All right, we are back, closing out the week. It is Friday, folks. And uh, I'm going to grab my schedule here, Gene. I want to let everybody know what I have booked so far next week. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm working on getting some in-studio guests. But I know for a fact, uh, on Tuesday, we're going to have Stetson Blaylock on. Uh, he will not be in studio, but we will have him on. Uh, Chris Zaldane. Is going to make the trip up from Fort Worth. He's going to be in studio on April 1st. Uh, Luke Palmer, Oklahoma angler on the Elite Series, is going to be in studio on Monday, April 30th. And then I spoke to Jeff Crete, uh, depending on what, once again, the situation with Major League Fishing and the BBT. Uh, Crete will be making an appearance in studio over the next couple of weeks, and I will continue to work on trying to get guests lined up uh, for this period of time. Like I said, we're gonna try and do either four or five shows a week 
uh, during this period, and hopefully we are bringing uh, really good information and some entertainment value to the people out there, to our fan base that we've uh, really worked hard to build up, and hopefully uh, we continue doing the three E's. You know what the three E's are? Entertain, educate, and engage when it comes to the anglers, the fans, and obviously the sponsors that make this thing happen. So, let, me write, let me write that down. Three E's. <laughs> the three E's. That's, that's kind of how I run my business and, and, and have run my business Good for a philosophy. long time. Good philosophy. All right, let's go back to the instant feedback, and then we may take a phone call or two if uh, we have somebody that wants to call in and give us a story or anything like that. Uh, Dennis in Illinois, Gene, wants to know, have you ever found anything tied up when you were doing electroshocking that shouldn't be tied up? Um yeah occasionally well i found i found cages um you know not not like fish on a stringer yeah but um there there were some you know little metal baskets or wire baskets uh that that were probably put out there to hold fish yeah was tony christian around uh, no oh, okay just checking <laughs> but uh it, it uh it's very rare very very rare that you ever find anything like that um and in fact most of the ones that i recall seeing were uh you know rusted up and like been there a while been there a while it's not not like there was something going on really that was any kind of illegal activity uh i i think those sort of things you know with social media and all these days it kind of gets blown out of proportion i think the the percentage of people that are trying to to do something illegal in in fishing tournaments is is incredibly small percentage right. and and uh uh it's just you know the media grabs a hold of it and kind of blows it up yeah but there are people out there like that gene yeah there are <laughs> well you know it, i mean it's 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 uh w- when there's money involved and yeah. when the money gets bigger and bigger and and especially when the the organization may be growing very quickly and they don't have a lot of controls in place yeah it it makes things a little more a yeah. little easier to do things like that you know i've said this uh last year was the 20th anniversary of the whole tony christian situation with the cages and and that whole situation that went down and i've said numerous times uh, I have really tried to find Tony Christian because I would love to do a 20 feet deep documentary on that whole situation. So if there's anybody out there listening that knows where Tony Christian is, uh, <laughs> please shoot me an email, mark at basszone.com. I have, I have talked to numerous people that I thought that would come in contact. I, I think he's obviously totally removed mm. from fishing. People, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, all you got to do is go out and Google Tony Christian and uh, not a whole lot of information out there, but there is a little bit, but would be, I, I feel that if Tony was willing to finally talk about it would be a very, very compelling 20 feet deep. So hmm. there you have it, folks, Tony Christian. I'm looking for him. If anybody knows where he is, please send me an email, Mark at basszone.com. All right. Matt in Minnesota wants to know what's your personal best small mouth and large mouth. Uh, large mouth is uh, ten eight. We're at. Do you remember ten? That was uh, Lake Thunderbird here, in Norman. What century was that? It was the. <laughs> it was Black Friday. Uh, about I don't know. It's probably been close to ten years ago now. Wow. And there were only two boats on the lake that day. Me and Matt Pangrak. <laughs> and I didn't have I a camera. I remember that. I didn't have a camera, yeah. and I yeah. caught this fish. And and I and I, uh, I I frantically was trying to find somebody that could take a picture of it. And here's Matt down there fishing by the dam, and Matt <laughs> helped me weigh it and take a picture of it. And it was like two ounces off the lake record. Wow! Uh, biggest smallmouth was six twelve, uh, Lake Saint Clair. Nice. Uh, about uh, three years ago. Very nice. All right, Dave in Texas wants to know: Is there? Kind of up and coming interest from some of the collegiate anglers, maybe uh, in in becoming fisheries biologists. Uh, a little bit. I, I wouldn't say it's it's real. Most of them are getting into you know marketing degrees and that sort of thing. Yeah, there are a couple of them. Uh, Nolan Miner that I mentioned from West Virginia, he's actually getting a degree in in wildlife and fisheries at West Virginia. 
there, there's a few of them. You know, I, I think, uh, I think the ones that are that are looking into that sort of thing, it's it's like, well, my goal is to be a professional angler. And if that doesn't work out, then I've got this other thing that I can yeah, that I can on. fall back on. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. Bruce wants to know when shocking fish up. Has anything come up that really shocked you? Um, well, the the biggest thing that you run into. I mean, you know, you, you see all kinds of fish, um, and, and uh, I, I was shocked up grass carp that weighed eighty pounds that were you know five feet long yeah uh looks like a giant torpedo coming up out of the water <laughs> uh the the thing that really to most people that that have done much electrofishing that that probably causes them more uh, startling uh, than anything is when you run across a beaver oh uh, geez beavers do not like electricity and and they will just go absolutely berserk and uh it doesn't stun them like like the fish and the, they just lay there and you can net them and get them out of the water they yeah. go crazy and and uh, certainly you get you get off the foot pedal and turn the juice off as soon as you see one but it can be uh, just like a an explosion in front of the boat when you run across a beaver how about giant koi where people have put koi fish in the yeah. lake or anything? koi and gold goldfish um yeah you know you'll see uh, and they're pretty obvious you know because they're so brightly colored for the most part uh, you kind of wonder how come how, how come they didn't get eaten when they were little because yeah. they're so brightly colored they'd have been an easy target and i think that's why you don't see very many of them out there in the lakes is and they get munched on. they get munched pretty quickly <laughs> yeah kind of like that you know the the fire craw jackhammers you know it's a uh, you see something bright orange and red out there it doesn't last very long in nature <laughs> Yeah. All right. A uh, number of people on the instant feedback. Have you been involved at all with the Asian carp situation on yeah. Kentucky Lake? Intimately, yes. Um, Bass has been very involved in trying to promote the uh, the work that's going on in the Asian carp situation. Not just Kentucky Lake, but the the whole the whole Mississippi River drainage. It's not just Kentucky Lake. That's kind of where it blew up a couple of three years ago when when fish were jumping in the boats on camera. But uh, the whole Tennessee River system, the Ohio and the Mississippi, uh, it, it is, at least in the Mississippi River drainage, uh, I think one of the biggest threats that we have. There's a lot of work being done on it. Uh, we're trying to raise awareness. And the main thing that we're trying to do right now is get people to recognize this is a really big problem and they need to contact their senators and representatives in Washington and get money directed to this problem so that it doesn't become bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, you know, as much as people don't like it, the, the political side of things is where we're going to make the progress. And, and that all boils down to dollars. And the state agencies don't have enough dollars, so it's going to have to come from Congress to make a real impact there. All right, let's see here. Frank in Michigan wants to know, between largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass, which one has the highest mortality rate during the tournament season? Probably smallmouth. Uh, they, they are a, a more easily stressed and a, a lot more high-strung, I guess you'd say. And so they, they tend to, to have a, a little bit higher mortality rate. The, the flip side of that is that... Uh, if tournaments are run in cooler times of the year, then it it's kind of a wash. Yeah. Um, and and so you know that's one of the things that we've always tried to do at Bass is as our season progresses, we tend to go north. Uh, as it as as uh, summer progresses, you you obviously you know when the water temperatures are 85 and 90 degrees in in Alabama, that's not a good time to be having a lot of tournaments. Uh, whereas up north where the water temperature might still be in the 60s yeah. uh, it's, it's going to be more comfortable and less stressful on the fish all right uh jason wants to know is there a lake that you wish that bass would go to and for whatever reason bass hasn't went to columbia river uh, I, I would love for in us, Washington in Washington State. Well, they've had an open there or yeah. a, a Western ba and Bass Nation stuff, yeah. you know, out there. But I, yeah. I, from an elite standpoint, I would, I, I wish we would go west, but it just the the logistics and the expense is just 
has been prohibitive. Um, but I, I think that would do two things. One is that it would really shine a light on, on what a tremendous smallmouth fishery they have out west. And two, it would help give us some ammunition to fight the anti-bass forces in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. You know, everything out there is so salmon and trout focused uh, that the, the warm water species like, like bass and walleye kind of get kicked to the curb. And to be able to showcase that kind of fishery and, and put some economic impact numbers out there to show that, hey, these fish are really worth something, I think that would really be a valuable thing we could do. It's just getting over the hump of, of the cost uh, of getting all the people and the equipment and, and everything uh, that far west when, when, you know, most of the major tournament organizations, face it, are, are – are headquartered in the southeast yeah and so going all the way west uh, for a major event like that is is a pretty tall order do you do you think and i i'm just throwing this out there because one of the things that we've seen from a fan perspective is the growth from fans in canada and obviously if you would move the classic to a different time of the year sure say in the next 10 years could you ever see the classic being based out of toronto or a large city in Canada. Well, the the biggest challenge with with moving the classic to a different time of the year is you either skip a year or you have two of them in one year. Yeah. Which is what they did when they flipped it right. to the spring. Back back in the ESPN days when yeah. they flipped it. The problem now is just the cost. The classic has grown into such a, a huge event and the the expo and and everything has gotten so big that the cost of trying to do two of those in one year, not just for bass, but for all the companies involved, the sponsors and the, the distributor, everybody, the, the cost is just prohibitive. And nobody wants to skip a year because then that just kind of screws up your whole schedule and, yeah. and who, what are we fishing for and what year is it and so on. And so I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I, I would love to see us be able to go places further north uh, i you know people ask me what's your favorite classic hands down pittsburgh 2005 it was, it, <laughs> and it took what 12 pounds it to took, win? It, right it <laughs> wasn't about the fishing yeah. it, it was about the whole experience the people the the everything was just great and uh, i would love for us to be able to go back to some of the northern venues uh, to, to do something like that chicago was horrible yeah, well, we'll take that one off the table. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll come right out and say, and if anybody out there wants to disagree with me, <laughs> fine, I'm ready for that debate. <laughs> yeah. But th there were a lot of reasons for that, and, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, yeah, I, right. I think there were a lot of valuable lessons that were learned from that classic that Woo Daves won in Chicago. But still, uh, I, I don't know, man. The, the, the brand is starting to expand, and I see – so much more interest yeah. from north oh, of the border no doubt so no doubt. i i don't know i i think you know uh, certainly i'm i'm sure that the 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 management at bass is probably you know always going to be looking at, at opportunities like that uh, and and how we can take advantage of those sort of things um that's way above my pay grade though <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, decisions will, and obviously what we're dealing with now, and and the challenges that lie ahead. Sure. But from a, a discussion standpoint, well, the, I, the I, other, I would like to see that expand. Sure, but the other thing that a lot of people don't understand, and I get this question all the time, is why doesn't bass come to my lake or my reservoir? Yeah, and the way I try to explain it to people is, it costs a lot of money to bring the circus to town. Yeah. And bass doesn't go somewhere just because the fishing is good. It's because host communities are helping pay to bring us there. And certainly with the classic, that's a whole different level because you not only have to have the fishing, but you've got to have an arena. You've got to have a huge convention facility. You've got to have lots and lots of hotel space. You know, you've got to have that whole package of uh, infrastructure to bring something of that magnitude to town yeah. and and it costs a lot of money and that's but even scale it down to an elite or a bass nation tournament um the the 
the logistics of getting people and trailers and equipment and all of that uh, is is an expensive proposition and um, that's why there's certain communities around the country that they get it dayton tennessee for example on chickamauga they actively court bass tournaments because they know that if they if they give a, a tournament organization x number of thousands of dollars they're going to get that return in economic impact many many times over right and they realize that you know i think i saw something in usa today a couple of years ago that that there's been like 10 million dollars invested in dayton tennessee in the last few years hotels restaurants gas stations you know that kind of stuff because of tournaments they get it but there's a lot of other communities where bass fishing and bass tournaments aren't top priority they don't maybe know a lot about it so yeah. they're a little standoff they're not willing to make that investment once they do it's more likely we will come back and if you look at the schedules that bass and flw and mlf and everybody else they wind up going to the same places yeah because those communities get write the check they they write a check yeah. because you know our, an average elite tournament they say is worth two or three million dollars to the local economy the classic is worth 25 to 30 million dollars yeah okay but somebody's gonna have to pay something up front to get it there yeah yeah and i fully expected i know there was a lot of discussion a lot of jabber that bass was going to announce where the classic was going to be for next year uh really two three four weeks after the classic but now with everything that we're dealing with now i think that obviously is going to be delayed yeah uh, they they don't have a contract yet. Yeah. I, I know that that's part of it, and yeah. I, and I think what negotiations were going on has probably kind of been put on hold. A because screeching of the, halt. Yeah, yeah, and and so uh, um, I, I think they're probably pretty close, but there's just still so much uncertainty in the world right now. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Frank wants to know: Do you think on certain bodies of water that using live bait has an impact on the fish? not not negatively um the the studies that have been done on live bait versus artificial bait yeah um there's there's a slightly more mortality from live bait but typically the people that use a lot of live bait are harvesting those fish anyway and so and and the percentage of people that use live bait uh for the most part is not as high at least in the bass fishing world yeah and so it's it's a perception thing you know uh, a lot of bass fishermen see some guy carrying a string or a bass home and they think oh my gosh they're they're raping our lake (laughs) and and in in reality when you look at the 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 overall numbers yeah um it's not having that much of an impact all right burger in alabama he had a question about the tva but how i'm going to address that is we are going to have the guy that is in charge of all the aquatic vegetation for the TVA on this show in April. All right, and I don't have the guy's name in front of me. David Brewster? Man, I can't remember. He was he was at the classic. Okay. Uh might be, but I I cannot recall his name, but I Mm. talked to him. Uh Brad and myself uh met with him and he agreed to come on because he wants to come forth and really kind of squash a lot of the rumors and a lot of the black helicopter stuff and all that and everything so uh we will get into in detail what is taking place from an aquatic vegetation standpoint on the tva uh here in the upcoming days and weeks yeah there's that and that's what i was mentioning earlier when and and my my brain started clicking back in when we took the airboat tour at gunnersville uh, Buddy Gross was the other uh, Bass Elite Pro that there went you with go. us. Buddy from uh, from Tennessee, and Wes Logan from Alabama, and uh, th- that was the whole idea. Was they wanted to show a couple of our pro anglers? Look, TVA is not decimating the vegetation, yeah. and and uh, and say we're we're not the bad guys here. Uh, and so th- there's so much of that going on in the, around the country where where the agencies that are in a lot of cases mandated to do vegetation control by you know the state legislature says you will control hydrilla or whatever the evil plant is uh, the the legislature says you will do that and the state has to do it they may not like it 
uh, and they certainly want to try to do it in in some sort of balanced approach and that's that's like i said earlier that's where we've got to get anglers involved in that process so that that we've got a, a seat at the table to make sure that that our interests and i'm not talking about just from tournament standpoint i'm talking about bass fishing in general yeah that that the bass fishing community is represented in those discussions so that the homeowners or the lake associations don't just run the show uh, because that's that's kind of what has happened in a lot of places where things have gone south on us is the fishermen didn't have a voice and so what the government hears from are the squeaky wheels the the homeowners the lake associations the marinas and so that that's what they do is they try to cater to those people and and we've got to get anglers have got to be more organized and more involved in that process yeah so but, uh, yeah the tva guys the, there's two or three places around the country where where you know not just tva but there's other folks that that are involved in that that plant control process that i think it would be well worth trying to get some of those folks on the show to talk about you know what's really going on out there because yeah. there is there's just so much crap on social media that's yeah. just flat wrong and and you know once it goes around on facebook two or three times it becomes gospel <laughs> yeah uh yeah i know i know exactly what you're talking about gene all right a couple of people want to know does high water help the spawn high water depending on the timing high water during the spawn is not necessarily a good thing it depends on how high is high uh, if, if the water levels come up a couple of feet or so, that's not a big deal. The fish are still going to spawn. Um, if it gets too high and they tend to spawn much shallower and then the lake authority pulls the plug and drops the water level, yeah. then you got a lot of nests that get stranded. <clears throat> and also a lot of times high water means muddy water. And, and the, the problem there is that for the eggs to develop properly, they got to have warmth from sunlight and if the water's so muddy <clears throat> that the the sunlight can't get down to the bottom where the eggs are trying to develop then the eggs can can basically die the best time for high water is actually after the spawn the the most critical time <clears throat> in the young bass's life is his first summer they've got to be able to find a place to hide so they don't get eaten and at the same time, find a place where they can find the right kind of food that they need so that they grow up over the course of the summer. And when they go into winter, now they're big enough to fend for themselves. So having a little bit higher water in the summertime, especially from just post-spawn, maybe all the way into August, early September, uh, is really a benefit <clears throat> because it provides more of that nursery area, nursery cover and food that the little bass need to make it through that first winter. If they're, if they're too small, by the time winter comes along, they're just food for whatever else is out there, or they starve one or the other. So uh, high water can be kind of a a good thing or a bad thing but it just kind of depends on the timing and and how high is high all right i have a follow-up question on that but first i want to let everybody know we're going to wrap the show up with a phone call uh the number is right there on the screen but i will let everybody know 405 well that is not it <laughs> i thought i had it written down here good grief what happened to my other... And you know what? I was getting ready to read off a doctor's number. <laughs> that, that would have been... Oh, hang we'll, on. We'll see, see how much the... Uh, no, here it is right here. I don't, I don't have the page pulled up. It's 405-253-5543. Somebody give us a call. I got to make sure this stupid system is working. I worked <laughs> on it yesterday. I think I got the bugs worked out. And uh, we'll end the show with a phone call uh with a question for gene or myself or anything that you want to talk about what we've discussed today uh 405-253-5543 all right gene i want to know if let's say the spawn this year you talk about the key is making it to the winter 
for a fish that is in the spawn this year, how big will that fish be if he has good conditions by the time that the winter rolls around? Totally depends on what part of the country you're in and how much food he's had. Um, You know, if you're in South Texas or, excuse me, Louisiana, Florida, somewhere further south where they've had a long growing season, they've spawned relatively early and they've grown all year, you know, you can have you can have fish that are four to eight inches there can be that you know a pretty big range um under under ideal conditions uh you go up north where they have a very condensed growing season yeah you know from the time the ice goes out until it comes back um everything's really kind of compressed uh those little fish may only be a couple inches long um so it it just a lot of it just depends on on uh, latitude as much as anything what part of the country you're in and and what the ideal conditions are obviously smallmouth uh, spotted bass largemouth they all grow at a little bit different rates um you know we're talking here primarily largemouth but uh uh ideal conditions you know i mean i've seen fish in in southern waters that were close to a foot long um by the by their first winter you know i mean that's just absolutely wow perfect conditions where there's not a lot of competition and there's an overabundance of food so all they got to do is eat and, <laughs> and get bigger and you know i mean that's all that's really all that bass do is they eat and make babies um so wh- when they're not spawning they're yeah. eating that was the the line from jaws remember that it, it was like they do three things Swim, eat, and make babies. That's yeah, it. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do this. Let's go to the phones. Hey, who's on the line? This is Chuck. Chuck, how are you, man? Where are you calling from? Uh, Yukon. Not very far away. Oh, uh, okay. All right, man. What's on your mind today? Well, back to the electrofishing stuff. I wanted to ask Gene about Texoma and alligator gar. Did the big alligator gar come up on the electrofishing results? They they do occasionally, um, you know. For the most part, the the type of habitat that those big gator gar live in is is not the kind of places that we would be targeting for for trying to find bass. Uh, the you know they're they're going to be more in in the shallow, warm backwater areas uh, where where there's not as much of the types of cover that you would want to try to look for bass. Uh, they're they're there, uh, and and you're more likely to see long nose and spotted gar than the big gator gar. Uh, <clears throat> certainly at Texoma and places like that, but uh, it, it's more of a habitat difference than anything that that kind of keeps those things from showing up as as much as you would, you know, say in in prime bass habitat. Okay, so I was just wanted to see if we could keep months out of the kayak a little while longer. <laughs> I, I'm, I already committed to it. I, I did it on a previous show. I am going to get I, I, in a kayak. You know, I, I, I'm ready to see it. I, yeah. I know that they're they're out there. Those I remember growing up as a kid, I fished Texoma because I grew up in North Texas. And I remember the, my little skinny skeeter boat that I had back then. It was only like five feet wide. That those big gator gar would come up on one side of the boat and they you know they breathe oh, air yeah. so they gulp air and he'd dive down under the boat and i'd see a head on one side and a tail on the other yeah you know these things that are you know six eight feet long back then and scary and I, looking yeah and uh it it's it's kind of a startling thing when you're when you realize that that dang fish is is wider than my boat it's longer <laughs> than my boat is wide you know and I th- wow that's there's a lot of fish there yeah all right, man. Appreciate you calling in. Thank you. All right. See ya. All right. System works. All right. Just a couple other things that I got to get worked on, but uh, hey, it worked. Yeah, alligator gar on Texoma. I remember the first time I ever saw one. I was fishing uh, with with Pat Sheeler, who, who you remember Pat, worked yeah. at UPS, and yeah. we had never seen anything like that before. We freaked out. <laughs> I thought Pat was going to lose it. And then uh, it was the same thing that that even though we were in a, a fairly wide boat up at the front, one of those alligator gar went across the front of the boat, and you could see head and tail, 
And they look like, well, obviously they are prehistoric dinosaur creature looking things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. And then, you know what Pat tried to do? He tried to hook it. (laughs) And then, have you heard about the story about uh, Matt catching the one at Ten Killer? No. Oh, yeah. We we had to uh, lasso it in. (laughs) They were up spawning, I guess. Uh Is that what they do? I mean, they were up spawning on the rocks and stuff. And he's like... Man, I want to go catch an alligator gar. And then we spent an hour, over an hour, trying to get this thing in. And he got it, and he had it cradled up. But the only way I could get it up in the boat was by taking the rope and actually tying the thing up to winch it in the boat to where he could hang on to it. And then he had all kinds of crap all over him and everything. I mean, it was just... But he, you know, I guess it was a bucket list thing. Yeah. Well, they're 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 fun to catch, especially the the... The long nose and the spotted gar. I've got a, a f- former uh, biologist over at uh, Holdenville, Danny Bowen, who's a avid, avid kayak tournament angler. Yeah. Uh, he goes over to Ufala and in the summertime, the hot summertime, and catches gar. And uh, you know they're they're acrobatic like a like a tarpon almost. You know? Wow. And, and uh, so it's uh, it's it's quite a sport. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I know. Do they try and catch them with? bows and bow fishing do they do that oh yeah bow yeah. fish bow fishing is very popular for guards it's uh doesn't the catch and release ethic is not real strong with no. that bunch but uh, <laughs> uh and that and that's one of the challenges that the a lot of the states that are managing gars because they're they're not endangered but they're getting close because yeah. they're they're a big river old big river fish some of those big gar are like 75 years old and so uh you know, there's there's a lot of concern about over harvest, especially those big old fish. So it's a uh, it's kind of a challenge for the agencies to figure out how to manage that kind of a thing. All right, everybody! Uh, wow, what a great show! We've went almost 90 minutes, Gene, and just a plethora of information. <laughs> really, really good stuff for everybody out there. So I want to thank Gene for coming in studio anytime. Welcome anytime, man. We got so many resources here, really close to where we live with with Bradley and and so many other guys that we're going to try and get in studio during uh, these challenging times. So I do want to mention also uh, Burger in Alabama. Have that gentleman send me an email with his contact info. Once again, mark at bassone.com. I know I got his card around here somewhere, but just to make sure, now with uh, everything going on, we might be able to get him on the show a little bit sooner than what was originally planned uh, with the uh, man that's in charge of the aquatic vegetation for the TVA. So... Please, please send me that info. We'll try to get him on as soon as we can. All right, next week, look for the schedule. Right now we're planning on four shows next week. Uh, Stetson Blaylock, and I will be working on other people for that show. Wednesday, I believe we're going to have Hank Cherry on, uh, the Bassmaster Classic champion, and then I will fill up the remainder of the week, everybody. Please hang in there. Everybody be safe. That's it. We're out of here.